So I have the big you know, task of finishing this conference. So I will talk again about what it is, animal welfare. We have used the term welfare, dog welfare, animal welfare for quite some time. Let me wrap it up. This slide you saw, more or less the same slide you saw yesterday. I won't be talking about it again. I just want to stress this is the new topic. 40 years is nothing in the history of humans and dogs together, history of humans and any animals together. So what we discussed he discuss here are actually new problems, new ways of looking new ways looking at animals and humans together. So concept of animal welfare. Dictionary says to us that welfare is the state of animal doing well. So animal welfare should indicate when animal is doing well. This is the narrow term. Let me remind you we have a, a big concept of animal welfare when we, when we are talking about how animals should be treated. And we have a narrow concept which says how animal is doing. Is it doing well? Is the animal's this dog's welfare good or not. There are different approaches to define when animal is doing well. But we must understand that it is impossible to give exact scientific definition of what animal welfare is. We can have a working concept, but we, want, we won't have a scientific definition. Why is that so? First of all, the term animal welfare is value laden. This, un this means that there are values in it. By telling that animal is in good state of welfare, by telling that this is mean that animal is healthy, we are saying that it is good for animal to be healthy. It is good for animal to be well nourished, safe. It is good that animal can express innate behavior. These are value judgments. Value judgments cannot be put in the scientific definition. As we get more knowledge, we get better understanding of what is good for animal, for what is good for dog, what kind of behaviors are good for dog, and what kind of not. So as our knowledge increases, the concept of what we believe to be good for animal changes. So this is complicated term. We have three different approaches and we have combination of those approaches. Uh, Function-based approaches are, have been for quite some time most prominent and common in animal welfare science, in veterinary, and it's connected to the biological functioning of an animal. What is biological? functioning. This is health, this is growth, behavior, development, reproduction. It is something you can measure. So manufacturers love it, veterinarians love it. You can tick the boxes and say animal is doing well. 
If we say that animal welfare is only biological functioning, then the situation where animal is unable to reproduce means that animal has a bad welfare. We as a dog people know that dog can be sterilized, neutered, or it can have some problems because <coughs> why it doesn't reproduce without being unhappy dog. So this function-based approaches are often connected to the measuring of the st stress hormones. But then again, we know that the dog can stress when uh, you have uh, female dogs near in heat and your male will go crazy and be all stressed out. Does it mean that his overall welfare is bad? Well, not so sure. The function-based approaches use a lot of the term coping. So what is coping? Coping with Coping is having control over mental and physical stability of the body in the normal and extraordinary situations. But the bad thing about the term coping, so animal welfare as animal coping with its environment, is that if animal doesn't cope with its environment, then it's dead. So you, you have limited options of saying whether animal does good or not. Then we have emotion-based approaches that take totally and completely different approach. And uh, they are reaction to the function-based approach. They say that animal welfare is deeply connected with emotions and feelings with avoiding pain and suffering, but also promoting positive emotions. You must remember that animal welfare is from an animal point of view, what is good for animal. So sentience becomes the substance of the animal welfare. The fact that animal feels and it wants to avoid pain, suffering, and promote emotions. So in this approach, we have health and welfare separated. So you can have sterilized dog that don't have all biological functioning and being in a good welfare. What's the problem with this approach? Feelings are difficult to define in humans, not talking about animals. Impossible to measure directly, completely, and complicated and difficult to measure indirectly. We have learned a lot about dogs in recent years, but even dog people have sometimes difficulty to reading their dogs. And then we have nature-based approaches that say that animal welfare is not only health and emotions. They are basing welfare on what is natural, what is intrinsic to an animal species or in dogs to a breed. So how the thinking goes. There is an example uh, to illustrate the fourth experiment to illustrate this approach about uh, monkey, let's say gorilla, being caged up for all its life. But with medicines, it's kept healthy. With uh, Drugs, it's kept happy. 
So both approaches of emotions and function-based say that the animal is in good welfare. But there's something wrong with this concept. This, there is something else that we want to say about this gorilla in the cage. We want to say that gorilla should not belong to the cage. We want to say that it should be able to live differently. So they say there are a kind of nature to animals that cannot be suppressed in the process of using animals for human benefit. And we need to keep this in touch. However, critiques say that not all that is natural or fitting to the environment created by humans So, what is natural might not fit into our environment. It's natural for dogs to growl, bark, bite. It's not something we want into an environment that we have created. And not all that is appropriate to this environment is natural. So, there is a tension. Natural not, might, not always might be the best for an animal. We as a breeders know that uh, uh, females can have two to three liters a year. We don't consider this the best for an animal. And what is natural to the dog anyway? If it what is specific to the man-made breed? What is this nature that we should go back? So all three approaches have their shortcomings. This is why people are combining all of the above. Three, all three approaches are narrow in their own. So it's proposed that for an animal to have a good welfare, it should ha score high in all three aspects. So we get the five freedoms. Five freedoms is one of the classical combinations of all approaches. So what are the five freedoms? Freedom from hunger and thirst. This is something to do with biological functioning. We need all animals need water, all animals need food. Freedom from discomfort. This, uh, this is about emotions. Freedom of pain, injury and disease. Again, emotions and biological functioning. Freedom to express most natural behavior. We get this nature of animal. Freedom from fear and distress. Again, emotions. Problem is with five freedoms, there are always problems. This is how <laughs> philosophy works. People might not agree which category should overweight the other if we have tension. So in the if we talk about the stray dogs of Greece, should it be ability to function normally? Should it be about biological functioning, breeding? Or should it be about freedom from hunger first, freedom from discomfort, from pain, injury, disease? What will you pr prioritize? And I think this is a, a thing that uh, we as a dog people could find a common ground to agree on some minimal interpretation of the five freedoms, minimal in, in interpretation of what is good for animal, for what is good for dogs, and what is good for specific 
breeds. There are three major influences on the welfare of animals. They are interconnected, but we can talk about the three major categories. First is environment. We're talking about shelter, housing, kennels, tethering. Again, going back to stray dogs of Greece. Maybe it's not so bad to be a stray dog in Greece. You have a better climate. Being a stray dog in Finland, this is totally different climate. This is totally different environment. What kind of housing the dog should have? Is tethering okay or not? As I'm involved with the sled dogs, then ma major kennels in sled dogs are using tethering on regular basis. But this is not the dogs for forgotten on the chain. These are dogs that spend on the chain only minimal amount of time when they rest. So this is something different from culture where it's okay to put two-month-old puppy on a chain and forget it for 12 years there. This is something different. And we have to understand that it's all, not always the tools that are problem, but how are they used. Knife can be used to cut bread, but it also can be used to kill. Under environment, basically everything that is outside the dog we can put in this category. This means communication with other dogs, animals, all the tra traumas, contagious disease. This is outside of the dog. This is what influences its welfare, whether it's good for the dog to be or not. Culture. We have been talking a lot about the culture, about the culture in the different countries, about humanizing dogs. Culture does influence the welfare of animals. What we believe as humans, what we believe in certain uh, country, that what is appropriate for an animal, it influences their welfare. If we think that it's appropriate to chain up dogs for 10 years and forgetting them there, this will influence the welfare of animal. If we think it's okay to overfeed our dogs, this will influence the welfare of them. And the genes, the genetic makeup of the animal. <laughs> this is something the animal cannot escape. How animal is made. We can talk about here about uh, genetic diseases, predisposition to certain conditions. We can talk about flat-faced dogs here. It's all genetic make makeup of an animal that does influence how the animal fares. Is it doing well or not? As you see, they're all interconnected. Genes and environment. My Alaskan Malamut will fare well in minus 30, minus 35. It will love to be outside. It will hate me for closing it into the house. If you put the Chihuahua in the same environment, you will have a dead dog very soon. So the genes help 
animal to feed the environment. Culture. What we believe is appropriate for an animal will influence the environment that we are placing the dog in. It will influence what kind of dogs we think we should have. This is again the theme of the market driving the need for flat-faced dogs. Market driving for exaggerations. I think that breeders and owners, owners as future owners, but also as current owners, have ability to influence at least two of those categories. Owners influence the environment that they are putting the dogs in, but also the culture the dogs are living in. Breeders do influence very directly genetic makeup of the animal. And they are choosing the environment that they are letting their puppies go. We have been talking about the judges, but judges only judge what breeders present them. Breeders are the ones that are putting two animals together and that are producing certain looking animals. And on the breeders, I use it as a technical term. So, owner of a female dog that has pups. This is not a value judgment of breeders as uh, belonging to the kennel club as pedigree breeders, as a responsible breeders, as a puppy mills. Whoever breeds their female has this special responsibility. And yes, the education. We can educate the breeders, we can educate the owners, we can influence the culture. By that we can influence the animal welfare, how good our dogs are doing. Maybe yes, I'm idealist. But I do believe this can happen. And changes in the culture actually can happen very quickly. I remember times in Estonia when tethering dogs was very, very normal. That the free roaming dogs were normal. Today, this is not normality. This is frowned upon. This is something that gets bad looks from the others. One thing that I think have influenced the end of tethering, it still happens, but what did change the public opinion uh, is wolf dog conflicts. So we had in our country instances where wolves were killing dogs that are tethered. This changed the public opinion on tethering dogs. People started to realize that this is dangerous for the dogs to be on chains. It became apparent that dog on chain cannot actually protect your property and it cannot protect itself. Sometimes the shock is needed for culture to change. I think this kind of shock is what is needed for people to understand that if they want cute pups with big eyes, flat faces, the shock that this is not good for animal, that animal does not feel itself well in this body, might be what is needed to end the demand. 
but maybe again I am idealistic. So when we educate, we need to keep in mind this three major influences of the animal welfare. And yes, educating publicity will help at some point to change the culture of what we believe is appropriate for the dogs. So to wrap it up, animal welfare, we are talking from well-being of an animal from an animal point of view. To know what is good for animal, we need to have knowledge. The more knowledge, the better. But again, what is good for animal for its own viewpoint is still under debate. We do debate over it. It's an open debate. And we can be, as dog people, leading experts in this field. Since it's open for debate, it's not as strong as an strong concept as, for example, animal rights. It's much easier to argument from the animal rights perspective. This is basically why many extremists, if not all extremist welfare organizations are animal rights organizations. So we need to know who we are sitting under the same table with. And again, importance of education, importance of knowledge to educate breeders, to educate owners. Yes, educate publicity, but I think in many cases, the breeders should be, breeders and owners should be the focus. I feel that breeders have this special kind of responsibility. It's their decision to bring pups into the world and to place them in the certain homes. So give the breeders the tools, give them the knowledge, give them the education, give them the understanding of this special responsibility. So, questions? Questions, comments? I have some comments, but I sit down because I made some notes. Uh, just really, really shortly. Uh, my biggest problem with, with the current era, and we, we, are, we are talking about the challenges of the new era, that, okay, we have a lot of scientific evidences. We are doing a lot of scientific debates. We know much, much more about dogs now and before, and it is a fact that dogs were absolutely out of the focus of scientists for, for, for many reasons, but, but one is that dogs are a really, really complicated issue. Because, for example, in Hungary we have the ethology department of the university. They are worldwide known. They are the ones who, who, who started to, to, to examine the behavior of dogs 30, 40 years ago. And at that time, we exactly knew how the bees were behaving, but we had no idea about the dogs. What I want to say, the more we know about dogs, the health, welfare, biology, uh, behavior, we mostly build up our knowledge about dogs on Facebook and our point of view. And, and when we go back to the point when the welfare of a dog is, is, is abused, we tend, many people really tend to compare uh, the needs of a dog to our needs. 
when I, I think that, that I set up a birthday party to my dog, that I am the most fantastic owner on the world. I can be, but it doesn't mean because the dog doesn't give a damn on that birthday party when all the friends are invited because dogs don't even know mathematics. They cannot calculate that they were born two years ago. Okay, you can have fun, but it doesn't mean that that uh, means uh, that you are a good owner if you, for example, which happens, you don't give water to your dog because the, you do not want to find piss all over the flat when you get home. Because it happens. I've heard about such things. Okay, which one is the, the worst? And, and, and in many cases, uh, we don't realize uh, animal abuse. And in many cases, we fight against uh, people without, without any abuse at all. And it is a problem. Uh, I've heard a story two weeks, no, no, it was last week I've heard uh, at the university in Hungary. Uh, someone reported uh, the, the neighbor and police arrived because uh, they were reported for animal abuse because the dog, uh, because uh, they had a very skinny dog, uh, not, not well fed, and, and they called the police because, because it's animal abuse. And it was a dog, uh, with an age of around 12 years old, uh, going through uh, treatment of cancer. Was that dog abused? Naturally. And, and it is a mess, and it just presents that, that, that people, uh, animal welfare activists always, always go and complain, and they always find uh, something to report someone. In case a dog uh, has a negative impact on its life for one second, and it is obviously a negative thing, then it is immediately animal abuse, because uh, in many cases, uh, so I, I could talk about this topic for a really long time. It is a very complex thing. And, and uh, in case you are not uh, careful, you can cause much more harm than good. I must totally agree with you. Uh, we are talking, and welfare activists are often talking more about the negle neglecting dogs, neglection, and we are forgetting about the side effects of humanization, of too fat dogs, overfed dogs, dogs that are not exercised, that don't get this uh, physical and mental stimulation. <laughs> Those are as much of the problems as neglecting dogs. And I again have to go back to the uh, stray dogs of Greece. I think those dogs in many ways might have the better welfare than some of the show dogs or pet dogs that live in the homes that may be don't get enough of the physical and mental stimulation. It's a complicated issue. It is. There are no easy ways out. But the understanding of the problems is the one step closer to the solution. And no, I don't have the solution. Thank you so much.